Coming up on iOS Today, Rosemary Orchard and I talk about some fantastic camera apps for your iOS devices. Plus, we share the news, including that boing spring-loaded event that's coming up. Uh, we answer your questions and uh, provide some shortcuts and round things out with our picks of the week. Stay tuned. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. This episode of iOS Today is brought to you by ExpressVPN. If you really want to go incognito and protect your privacy, make yourself as invisible as possible with the number one rated VPN, ExpressVPN. For three extra months free with a one-year package, go to expressvpn.com slash iOS Today. Do 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 do. Welcome, welcome, welcome back to, or for the first time, if it's your first time. Hey there, how are you? Uh, please enjoy a complimentary ticket to the juice bar. Uh, this is iOS today, and and we we talk about Apple stuff, so that's why it's a juice bar. Um, this is the show where we talk all things iOS, Watch OS, TV OS, iPad OS, HomePod OS. And any new OSs that Apple might announce between now and forever. Uh, I am one of your hosts, Micah Sargent. And I am Rosemary Orchard. Hello, Rosemary. How are you today? Oh, I'm excited. I mean, you did the sound effect for, for the spring event, and I just love that. Uh, so we're going to get to talk <laughs> about that. Um, but we're yes. not going to talk about that straight away, of course. No. Uh, in fact, first, we're going to talk about one of the things that we buy our phones for. Uh, one of the main reasons I think that um, people are driven to upgrade their phones. And that, of course, is uh, the camera or camera system that's available on uh, your, your different devices. And with that comes the need for camera apps. And so we are going to talk about several different camera apps that are available to you. And uh, some of them, you know, less conventional or, or maybe not what you'd expect. Um, and some of them are ones that you've probably heard of, including the first one. Uh, Rosemary, what is the first camera app we're going to talk about today? Well, I thought we can't talk about camera apps without talking about the camera app. You know, the one that's built <laughs> into your iPhone, the one that's there if you swipe right from your lock screen. Yes, you can do that. Did you know that? That's probably something that some people didn't realize. Uh, so uh, this is my uh, lock screen here on my iPhone. And uh, you can see I've got some things to do. I just swipe right. Voila, I'm in. Uh, if I go back, you can press and hold on this button here in the corner and that opens your camera as well. If you press and hold on that, but I just swipe right and boom, camera app every time. It's great. Um, and, you know, there's a lot you can do with the camera app that maybe people don't realize. So one of the first things I want to mention is uh, if you look really closely at the video, if you're watching the video version of this, I've got a grid on my screen. Um, and that's something I use for the rule of thirds, which is something that you often do in photography. It's also just good for making sure that things are approximately in the center. Uh, so you don't end up with like weird photos where you're off to one side or something like that. And that is something that you can do in the settings app. So inside the settings app, if you scroll down, there's a section for camera and there's a whole bunch of things in here, but one of the options under composition is grid. And if you turn on the grid for the camera, um, then, you know, you get this, you know, three by three grid effect. Um, and that works if you rotate your iPhone as well. Uh, so uh, this uh, has broken things a little bit on the video stream. Hello, everybody who's turned their head sideways. Uh, I'll turn <laughs> that back. Um, but, you know, that's just one of the things you can do. There's also this little arrow right here at the top. Um, and if you tap on that, then there's a whole bunch of other options, including the square. Micah, did you lose the square, the, the Instagram square that everybody used to take pictures as before, you know, it, it upgraded a while it. ago? Yeah, it's right here. So you tap on the arrow at the top to reveal these settings. And then there's a button that usually says four by three. If you tap on four by three, then you can change it to square or 16 by nine if you want 16 by nine. And that extends things out, you know, behind the camera buttons. Um, and four by three is default. Um, but also if you take a picture, after you've taken the picture, it shows up down here. And then when you tap on the edit, then in the crop section, 
in the top right, then there's there's some pre, like preset options where you can change things to 16 by 9 squares and so on. So you should really have a dig around in the camera app if you haven't before. Um, and I'll just pop back uh, to uh, the camera app as well, because here there's some other options. So you can say that the flash should be auto and so on. That's a button that's actually in the top left. But down here, the controls are just a bit larger and easier to tap on. You can uh, adjust um, the uh, the um, the uh, exposure. That's the word I'm thinking of. I had a blank for a moment. So it's usually set to auto, but you can say that it should do a two second exposure or exposure should be off. Uh, I tend to leave that as auto because it's pretty good. You can toggle live photos on or off or just leave it on auto. Um, oh, this one's the exposure. The other one, uh, I've forgotten what the other one was. Micah, you're better at cameras than I am. Do you remember what this one was? Um, right here. That one is night mode? Is that what that is? Yeah, it's night mode. I thought it was toggling the exposure when it does that. It, it tells, it's that's how long the photo goes for. And so that's usually what that is. You also have timer options. Uh, which you can do. And then you also have, uh, as everybody loves from Instagram, dramatic filters. <laughs> because who doesn't love a little bit of silver tone in their life right here? You know, come on. Everything's in black and white. It's so much more dramatic. Oh, wait, let's get noir. Even better. Um, I love this. Um, and so, you know, the, the stock camera app can do a whole bunch of things. Of course, you also have things like your portrait mode, which has a couple of options. So uh, if I do stage light mono, then, you know, it's, it's, trying to take a photo like this. It wants me to move a bit further away. There we go. And now it's blacked out my background. Um, and uh, it's it's doing some very dramatic uh, lighting effects. It's also got panorama options, which will be very difficult to demo in my office while recording. Of course, there's videos, slow-mos, time lapses, all showing off my slightly messy desk because that's, you know, the way of life. And you can flip <laughs> these around to selfie mode as well, which is great. Um, something else I should mention, speaking of panorama mode, you do not have to use this in landscape mode. If you want to take a photo of, say, a really tall building or a Christmas tree, um, then you can actually do panorama mode from the floor upwards, where you turn your iPhone onto its side, you start taking the photo, and you just go up with your camera. And then you tap it again, so you can end pan panorama mode early. Um, but you can do that and take a really tall photo um, and you don't have to like try and like hunch down on the floor, especially if you're trying to take a photo of a Christmas tree. It's probably cold, um, maybe a bit damp. You don't want to be doing that. Um, and um, you can, you know, you can take this really lovely tall photo and you don't have to crop things. And it's just lovely. So the stock camera app, you know, a lot of people think yeah, it's it's OK. It's it's actually really good. And I would highly recommend having a good dig around in there and uh, seeing what else you can do with it that you haven't yet done. Yeah, I think for me, I tend to use the built-in camera app as my camera app. And then where the the sort of different differentiation comes in most of the time is through third-party editing apps. Um, Photos has some built-in tools, but none as good as some of the third-party apps that are out there. But I like to use the camera app because I feel it takes... Um, in most cases, the best possible photos that you can get from your iPhone. And so I want to have as close to kind of the real thing, no layers in between, uh, anything like that. Just get me the photo and give me the photo with all of Apple's magic baked into it. And what better way than using the built-in camera app? That said, I know people of multiple generations um, of, of three different generations who, instead of using the built-in camera app on their phone, launch the Snapchat app and use the camera app that's built into Snapchat. And I just, I find that incredibly fascinating. I find it, um, it's just a, it's a completely different kind of uh, sort of process. And, you know, I've asked about that before, <laughs> like how come uh, they use that app and, you know, what is it that that makes you launch that instead? And it comes down to just uh, kind of muscle reflex. Um, that's just the app that they've used and, and that's the app that they've always used. And so, again, no judgment there. It's just fascinating how different people use different apps in different ways uh, to... To, to be their basic camera app. But as Knox Harrington in the chat had pointed out, is like 
yeah, that's kind of always been the tough sale, sell for me with um, camera apps is why would you bother with another camera app? Um, because they don't have any compelling reason to switch or a compelling reason to go through the extra steps to launch when the camera app that's built in is right there, as you said, a swipe away. Um, and all of those, I think, are the you know a big reason as to why I use the camera app. But then it's doubled by the fact that I know that the camera app itself is going to be making use of the latest APIs and, and uh, all the special magic that Apple bakes into the camera system that uh, some of the third-party apps might not have right away. Um, speaking of apps made by Apple, you've got another one that you want to talk about that uh, I think anybody who does social media stuff um, might be interested in using. Although I've always found it incredibly difficult to understand how to use it. Um, tell me about Clips. How does it work? Well, <laughs> well to start with, uh, Clips Clips is an iPhone application. Uh, surprise, surprise. And uh, Clips can do things like this. Um, so I've got this little uh, word spring, which is tracking my head. So if I move from side to side, it's following me. If I do a little bob up and down, it goes with me, kind of like a crown. Um, and this is one of the things that you can do in lots of apps like Snapchat, Instagram, TikTok, and things like that, which you can't necessarily do in the native app. And uh, if I don't want that to move, I can disable tracking and now it just stays there, which is you know not quite as exciting and re-enable tracking and so on. Um, um, but this is just one of the many things you can do. And the point of Clips is it's a video application. So you can take fancy, cool videos with random effects, um, like this one I did earlier today. Um, and you can, um, you can use those on multiple social media platforms without watermarks. So one of the things I frequently see is people have posted their video on TikTok and then they share it and they post it on Instagram. Only then you're watching it on Instagram and it's got a little TikTok logo on it. And one of the things that I try to bear in mind is what is future me going to want from these memories? Is future me going to want to remember that I made this video for TikTok or is future me going to want to just have the video so that I can enjoy it and look back without having to uh, mess around with, uh, you know, all of these watermarks and stuff like that. Um, and, you know, some of these videos are going to be really silly, but at the same time, there you can do a lot of things. So in, in the Clips app, we've got this little rainbow star where we can do all these effects just like Micah is demoing. Um, and it's it's pretty cool. So you can, um, a comic book is one of my favorites. Um, but if you change, you know, you can also have an emoji head. Uh, so I can have a slightly <laughs> giant looking head. I'm going to move my head a bit further away. There we go. Um, where I've got some fancy purple highlights on. Oh my Aura. goodness. Look yeah. at those highlights. Yeah, blue witch's hat. Um, how about overly dramatic with red highlights? I had that a few years ago. Um, or even Santa hat me. There we go. Me with a Santa hat and much shorter hair. Um, and you can, you know, toggle all of these individual things on and off. Um, and that's one of the things that I kind of love about this. Um, you know, you can add all of your stickers and um, it's got a separate section for emoji. Um, but you can just sort of add things on your screen, tap to move them around. If you tap with two fingers, you can rotate and, and you know, make things bigger. So I can block out my face. And look, it's tracking. So it's actually blocking out my face. So if you want to, re to record something, but not necessarily have somebody's face on, on it, but their voice is okay or something, or just, you know, you want to protect a child's identity, things like that, where you can, you know, add uh, emojis to things um, to cover it up. And of course, you can tap on any of these things and edit so you can replace it. So I could... Uh, there we go. That's I think that's much better. Um, I don't know about you, Mike. If, if this is uh, improved, oh yes, as far as that's you're actually perfect. Yes, yeah, yeah. I think the mustache <laughs> really really makes that one. Um, <laughs> but um, you know, so you have all these options, and you can add soundtracks as well. So if you wanted to add a variety of soundtracks, they've got default ones built in here. Um, you can also pick things from your music library. So if you've got specific things from your music library that you wanted to add, you can do that. Um, and you can also um, create multiple projects. So if you want to have multiple things on the go, you can do that and then you can return to things. Um, and uh, here's something I actually started um, last year. Um, <laughs> And Micah appears to be having some fun over there. Oh, my project's refusing to download. That's always fun. Um, so I'll just go back into the one I started earlier today. But you can also add things. Uh, so I can add um, this uh, video uh, or this photo I took earlier 
um, which uh, is clearly very important. That is a battery pack, a iPhone XS uh, battery case, and a fun size banana for scale because everybody knows bananas are the universal scale universal of the scale. internet. Um, and so there's this pink button here. And the way that you record is you tap and hold on that. And then it records your, your voice as well. Um, or if you just tap once, um, then it, it should add a still if it hasn't already done that. Um, and then you can tap on any individual um, item here um, in in your play uh, play area, um, and then you can you can trim things um, or you can uh, delete things. Of course, straight up, you can do a split view, uh, or a, sorry, a split where you you just separate it. So you could add a photo or something in between. Um, you can also duplicate things. You can save individual clips. You could mute clips as well. So if you've got you've you've got a clip where you don't like what it's it sounds like then you can just mute that um and of course it's it's not letting me do that because i'm also sharing my screen which is messing things up a little bit um but you know there's a lot that you can do with this and it's kind of in many ways better than what's built into tiktok and instagram and so on because you can then share exactly the same thing on all the platforms and everyone will go oh my god how did you make this because you have a unique set of stickers, which are only available in clips. Um, and, you know, the, these text options, um, you know, there's there's obviously things like the time and so on, but there's next, there's back. Um, there's the name of the town that I was in the other day. There's before, swipe up, um, uh, all these things, you know. So this happened. Yes, Micah, we, we all know this happened. That, that <laughs> That's clearly uh, life. Uh, Friday, uh, very important that this is Friday. Um, everybody should know that it needs to move around when I move my head because it's a little bit more distracting. And away we go. That's clips. Um, it's it's great fun. Um, after you've you've got all these things, you can you know tap and hold to record, um, and then it adds that, and then you can share afterwards. Uh, and uh, you you've got your people in the share sheet, and you've got all of your apps and uh, you know other ex- extensions. So you can uh, if you wanted to send it over to say Instagram and share something on Instagram. I probably won't actually put this video on Instagram because it's not all that great. Um, But, you know, you could. It's right there. Nice. Yes, clips. Um, It's it's gotten a lot better over time, and I've seen a lot of people make use of it for for the sake of having a... um, for having captions. So where a lot of apps, you kind of have to do captions afterward, or you have to trust the uh, built-in captions that are there. Um, this one has captions um, as part of the system and you can you know make adjustments to those as you need to. Uh, so I really like it for uh, that purpose as well. If you're looking for a way to make your uh, text, your uh, online content more accessible, um, this can be helpful for that for sure. Definitely the the live caption feature. I didn't demo it because it's incredibly distracting to me when I do that. And I'm also talking and there's a little bit of a lag as well uh, with the way that we we set up the recording. Um, so it, it's a little distracting, but that's definitely something that is, uh, it's very easy and it works really well in my testing. Um, and I, I really like that. And I always use it on little videos I send to my grandmother uh, just so that she can, you know, still hear what is being said when her iPad is inevitably on mute. (laughs) Um, All right. Let us uh, talk about um, one of my uh, picks, which is one that I think a lot of uh, nerds end up uh, talking about, a lot of nerds end up using. It is an app that before I talked about how the camera app, uh, the reason why I like it is because it gets as close to um, you know the, the metal, so to speak, as it possibly can. Um, this app kind of does that as well. And I just remembered, I want to make a quick note. Um, the other day I got an, uh, a message <clears throat> where someone said, um, you realize that your background is blurry, right? So there's really no need to uh, censor whoever it is that you're covering up with this, um, with this bit of paint. So the person thought that we had added in post a white splotch over somebody that's on this poster because it was like inappropriate or for some reason, uh, just so you know, that is not uh, what's happening there. It is that my light is reflecting. <laughs> the lights that I have in front of me are reflecting off of the uh, covering over this poster. <laughs> and it does kind of look like someone in post just boop, 
put a little dot of of white uh, over the top of somebody that looks bad, I guess, at the poster. But no. Uh, so they they said that they found it incredibly distracting, um, and the whole time they were wondering who it was behind the 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 sensor. But no, there's no sensor. It's just, it's just the light reflecting off of the poster. Um, so yeah, I had to mention that uh, as as I just remembered that that had happened. Uh, anyway, so what do you do? If you're looking for an app that is as good as camera, meaning like it has that that uh, level of understanding of Apple's offerings, and you want an app that maybe has a little bit more um, zhuzh to it, well, that is where Halide comes in. Halide is a really cool app um, that is... You should just read some of the blog posts that the Halide folks uh, put together uh, because it is incredible. Um, the level of detail, the level of um, control that you have over the system to make um, the fo- the exact photo that you want to make. So I'll talk a little bit about the controls here. Um in the on the main uh, screen, they kind of try to keep it sim- simple, and at the bottom, you've got some different tools and a little uh, bar that you can take and slide up. So here are some options here. In the top left is a histogram at the top, and you you know right now I'm bringing it down, and I can change uh, the way that that histogram is. Um, let me tap that again, so you can see the luminance histogram at the top there. And then I can also make adjustments to, you were talking earlier about the uh, different grids that you can do on the screen. And then there's also that rotate camera button. Um, From there, I'll swipe that back down and we'll tap on this and I can show you that you can uh, turn off the camera button. I'll put that back in the top, by the way. Um, Excuse me, turn off the grid, uh, turn on the grid, it, uh, there, there's a way to change which grid you have, but I can't remember it in this moment what wh- how you do that. So I'm just going to leave the grid off for a second. But if I tap in the top left, I can change the type of histogram that it has. Uh, so there's a waveform histogram, a luminance histogram, and a color histogram. And for folks who are wondering what those different ones mean, what those different ones mean, um, the luminance histogram shows you uh, the light value of your photo across a grid. And so it shows you which parts of the photo are bright, which parts of the photo are darker. And the uh, color histogram uh, shows you RGB, red, green, blue um, colors across the spectrum and kind of where you have lots of colors um, and where you have less color. And then the waveform you can see here is pretty cool. Uh, It's picking up the red in my lips and in my skin. And as I move my camera, it shifts where those show up because it's showing you um, the color values of those portions of the screen, of those portions of the photo as I'm moving around. So you can get a really good understanding of the components of your shot before you take the shot and uh, make adjustments accordingly to make sure that you get the photo that you actually are trying to to get. So I'll tap that again to uh, pop it back up in the top left. And I like to have the luminance histogram on. Um, And then there are some other options here. So of course, I can uh, switch the camera between front and back facing cameras. Uh, So I will turn that around. And um, then you've got uh, your your front-facing camera there. And in the bottom right is how you switch between the cameras. So there's 1x zoom, 2.5x zoom, and of course, um, the wide-angle 0.5x zoom. And so I can switch between those. I'll go back to 1x, and I will switch it back to the front-facing camera. And then you've got your your built-in timer, of course. Um, So 3 seconds, 10 seconds, 30 seconds. And uh, auto white balance, you can change uh, if you don't want it to auto white balance to those ones that you might be used to um, that from from any DSLR, including cloudy, it's uh, bright sun, uh, I think that's tungsten, like fluorescent, I mean, and uh, LED light or something like that, uh, blue there. Um, and then there is, uh, I'll talk about the Pro Plus button in just a second, but I also want to show you in the top right here, which lets you switch the cameras between auto and manual. 
um, which will let you make adjustments to exposure and shutter speed uh, on the screen. So that, those are those two. But then the last thing here is our zebras, which um, some folks know about zebras, some folks don't. But it's basically a way to look at a photo um, on the screen and better see um, what parts of the screen or what parts of the photo are peaking, what parts of the photo are well within range. And so as I make adjustments to the shutter speed, you can see that zebra there. And it is showing that in the back, um, that photo is really going to be blown out. As I drag it down, um, less of it is uh, outside of the range. And then the ISO at the top, I can take that and drag it down to make the photo darker or brighter and uh, make adjustments to the zebra there. I am terrible at this kind of stuff. So I just have that bad boy on auto as much as possible, but you can still make adjustments to exposure on the right side uh, just by tapping and holding to drag to the spot that you want. I'll re return that to normal. And then we'll go into settings here so I can talk about uh, Pro Plus. So um, within Capture, there are some different options here. And this is what I was talking about before with things getting really in-depth, really detailed. Uh, I'll read a little bit because I want to talk about what each thing does. Um, you can turn these different features on and off, but one of them is called coverage. And what that does is it captures a fully processed JPEG image, meaning that the photo is taken and it is a processed JPEG that Apple would kind of normally take with the, with the built-in camera system. And it also captures a raw image at the same time, meaning that you get both. Um, so that means that coverage will get the best possible shots. But of course, it takes longer because it takes two photos. Um, so you, your photos, you won't be able to take a bunch all at once. But by doing so, uh, the JPEG image will, be, will have higher quality. And you will be able to get kind of both options in case you want to do raw or you want to do the other. Uh, the format is raw or raw plus. Raw plus captures the uh, file as raw and then um, includes the HEIC, which is high efficiency image container. Um, or you can do a, uh, the standard raw, which is instead of doing an HEIC, it does a DNG. Um, I like to have uh, HEIC because they are. Um, they store a lot of information, but they do it in a small, small package. Um, and then the option to save Pro Raw. So this says that when you do have raw uh, photography on, you can um, you can capture Pro Raw files rather than the standard raw files. So uh, Pro Raw is another feature that Apple has that they released later after the new phones came out. That is just a um, more detailed uh, raw photo photograph that includes more information that you can use to uh, recreate your image. And then if you need to, you can reduce the bit depth of the photo. Uh, so instead of saving it at its standard size, you can save it at uh, 10 bit. And so that will kind of help you save. Um, there are some other settings in here as well that let you do some kind of processing stuff, but those are the main ones there. And honestly, this is the app that you want to use if you are looking to take uh, professional quality photos on your iPhone with as much information as you possibly can get out of the sensors that are built into your iPhone. Um, something kind of neat about uh, Halide is that <clears throat> when you first sign up, you can sign up for a uh, kind of a, it's a it's a temporary it's a short term email newsletter where they send you information that you need about uh, the the app and how to use it. And so you're able to kind of go through and understand a little bit more about how to use Halide. So I think it's a fantastic app. I get why nerds very much like it. And I will use it um, if I'm... When I'm taking photos that are just like photos of my dogs or what have you, I just use the standard camera app. But whenever I, uh, whenever we go to the beach or something like that, I want to take some really pretty shots. I always launch Halide because I want to get the best the best possible photo I can get. And oftentimes that means getting as much information out of the photo as you can. And that's where Halide comes into play. Um, it's available for free, but it does have an in-app purchase. Um, I think it's a subscription for... Uh, I can't see too well on that screen, but uh, yeah, $1.99 a month or $11.99 a year. 
And then if you're not big into subscriptions, you can just pay a one-time $40 purchase to have the app forever and ever. Um, but $1.99 a month is not very bad. And um, $11.99 a year is also not very bad. I think that's the one that I ended up going with. Um, for 12 bucks a year, you get this incredible app that gets updates all the time. And when Apple announces new camera technologies built into the iPhone, Halide is one of the first to jump on board and make sure they've got it uh, figured out. So yeah, that's my next one. Um, we are going to take a quick break uh, before we come back with more, uh, more good stuff. And I'm excited to say that this episode of iOS Today is brought to you by my favorite um, VPN, not only my favorite, but like the only one to use as far as I'm concerned, uh, ExpressVPN. ExpressVPN, you rock. Have you ever browsed in incognito mode? I do have to ask that question. Uh, incognito mode or private browsing mode or one of those things. In fact, I just asked this question of my partner the other day and then proceeded to tell him the important thing, which is that it's probably not as incognito as you think. Incognito mode, like the Chrome browser itself, is a Google product. And Google has made its fortune by tracking your movements online. In fact, there's even a $5 billion class action lawsuit against the company in California where it's accused of secretly collecting user data. Google's defense, incognito does not mean invisible. And <laughs> That's true. Uh, even with Safari and Safari private browsing mode, where Apple may not uh, be collecting that information that you use in the when you're in private browsing mode, but going to those sites is still something that is able to be tracked by your internet service provider. So your private browsing is not private. So how do you actually make yourself as invisible as possible online? You just use ExpressVPN. Even in incognito mode, your online activity still gets tracked and data brokers can still buy and sell your data. Data harvesters can use your IP address to uniquely identify you and your location, but with ExpressVPN, your connection gets rerouted through an encrypted server and your IP address is masked. Every time you turn ExpressVPN on, you're given a random IP address shared by other ExpressVPN customers. That makes it more difficult for third parties to identify you and harvest your data. And the best part is how easy ExpressVPN is to use. No matter what device you're on, phone, laptop, or smart TV, all you have to do is tap one button to get protected. I It, it seriously is that simple. Um, I use ExpressVPN on everything. And as I've said before, I almost always forget that it's running. I'll think, oh, I need to uh, turn on ExpressVPN. No, it's already on. I still get incredible speeds despite the fact that it's on and that it's you know working as it's supposed to. And ExpressVPN is a rock star VPN because it does not log your data. And that is something that can't be said for most VPNs out there. ExpressVPN truly does not hold on to your data. It has been proven time and time again, not only by independent uh, audits of the company, but also when governments come and request the servers that ExpressVPN has, they've got nothing there. There's no data there because ExpressVPN is not logging your data. Uh, money where their mouth is on that, absolutely. And that is why I uh, happily pay for ExpressVPN and encourage others to happily pay for ExpressVPN. Don't use a free VPN. Do not use a free VPN. Get ExpressVPN and know that your data is not being stored, tracked, etc. And that uh, you are protecting yourself online, whether you're using incognito mode or not. So if you really want to go incognito and truly protect your privacy, secure yourself with the number one rated VPN. Visit expressvpn.com slash iOS today and get three extra months free. That's what we're offering you. Three extra months free with a one-year package. That's expressvpn.com slash iOS today. Expressvpn.com slash iOS today. Thanks so much to ExpressVPN for sponsoring this week's episode of iOS Today and for being a doggone awesome VPN. Truly wonderful. All right, Rosemary Orchard, what is your next camera app for us? 
Well, my next camera app is based on the fact that we take these photos for reasons, right? We take photos, we take videos because we want to remember things. We want to remember how cute that kid was when they were doing uh, that thing or how silly that cat looked or whatever it is. Um, And so my next app is based around this and it's called One Second Every Day. And the idea is that you build a one second journal every day. And so you have a calendar and it's filled. Um, And so I I re-downloaded this. I was using it before. I decided to start over um, just because I I didn't, I hadn't kept up with it and I I wanted to try again. And so you can go through and you can backfill as well. Um, So you add something and you just say, okay, so that's good. You know, trim. Actually, no, I don't like that. I'm going to go right here from the beginning. Excellent. That looks great. That's a nice bowl of pasta. Uh, prawns and lemon, uh, by the way, for anybody who's curious. And you can go ahead and backfill. So uh, I've got the 3D printer and set it up. Um, and uh, yep, I think that's perfect. So I'm going to trim that and add that. And now if I pop back, okay, so now I've got seven days of data. Now, if I pop into the play, then I can actually play this. Um, and it's gone ahead and it just shows me a second of every single day. Um And uh, yes, that was today as well. And then shows me a little thing at the end. Um, And the whole point of this is you just pick one second from your day. And then at the end of the year, it's 365 or 366 sometimes seconds, which is not very long. That's, you know, six minutes, give or take. Um, And so you have all this. There's also an autofill option, which is going to just go through and pick things uh, from, you know, your your library from before. You have to grant it access to all your photos. But they're not going anywhere. They're on your device. Um, and you can go through it and pick things. So I've got some random uh, screenshots of QR codes and so on because I thought I was going to be without Wi-Fi when I went to Ikea the other day. Um, and, uh, you know, one second every day is very simple. When you go to, to add something, so say, for example, if I wanted to add something to today, then I can I can replace this or I can make something private. I can add captions um, and things like that. Or I can just straight up delete it. And then I can add a snippet and I can choose something from my camera or, uh, sorry, I can choose something from my library or I can add it from the camera. Um, and this is what happens when you set things up earlier on the wrong iPhone. Um, so, uh, you know, I can then go ahead and I could just, you know, tap and it will do one second or a couple of seconds. And then you say stop and then you just pick that section that you want, you you say trim and you're done. Um, and that's it. And that's your one second. Um, and you only get, a, you know, a snippet every day, one second. And if you want more than one second, then there's an option for that as well. Um, personally, I am just using the free version of this app, which gives me one project and one second every day um, with one snippet in it. And that's it. And if I, if I want to be sneaky and add two snippets in a day, uh, then I use clips or iMovie <laughs> or something to uh, to create two like half second snippets and stick them together, save them to my camera roll, and then add them here. Um, if you want more, so you can have unlimited projects like one for each child or something and 10 second snippets and so on and share your projects with a partner and add music and backups, then it's uh, $50 a year um, for um, the the pro version of this, um, which comes out to about $5 a month. You can also uh, sign up um, for just $5 a month. Um, and uh, you can sign in with Apple and everything as well. And it will show you things like your streaks, like, okay, so, uh, you know, I, I re-signed up for this one uh, today, this account, because I didn't want to share everything that was in it. Um, but your life movie currently, the length of it, ha- you know, your longest streak, how, you know, what's your current streak? How many snippets do you have? And things like that. Um, and you can also, you know, get details of your account and pop into the settings. So it can favorite the first snippet of every day. Um, and, um, you can say launch to the camera so that you, you open it and you take a photo every day. It also has, you know, tutorial videos and so on. Um, but I just find this incredibly simple to use. It's very small, but it works. Um, and you know, if you go through, then it tells you about some of the other things that you can do with it. And if you wanted to, to add another project, well, you can tap create project and give it a name and and go for it. Um, and I love the idea that, you can create multiple projects. So say, for example, you've got two kids, okay? And you, you realize, actually, you know what? I'm, I'm not doing a great job of documenting, you know, their lives growing up. It would be great to just have a really short video at the end of every year. Well, you could create one project for each kid. So you take a photo of your kids every single day and you, you put different pictures in different projects. And then at the end of every year, you have like six minutes of their, of their life. 
um, over the year. And you can share that with them or you can just keep it for yourself um, or you can wait until their, their first date and then show it to, you know, whoever <laughs> they're taking on their first date, um, you know, do whatever it is you like with it, or you can use it for pets um, or you can use it to document your progress in a particular hobby or something. And I just love the fact that you can do this. And if you, you don't do every day, so say if I went back and I added something uh, on the Wednesday, so I was uh, playing around with Signals, Micah, one of your app caps, um, I can do that. And then when I play, then it just skips from April 7th to April 10th. And that's totally fine. Um, I'm good with that. Um, so, you know, it's it's great. Um, you can also choose dates. So you could choose a week or a month um, or a year to export, or you can do um, custom where you can set, select everything, say, except, you know, those two. Um, so my half-eaten chocolate bunny um, gets mi mm -hmm. uh, missed and then you add it to a mesh and you can then share it um, and it will mash your memories together. And that's it, done. Um, and you can save that to your camera roll so you can share it um, later if you want to or just have it saved in your camera roll or you can straight up put it in the share sheet. So nice. I, I love one second every day. It's, you know, I'm using the free version. I can totally see why um, people would pay for the $50 a year version. The, the unlimited backups especially um, could be incredibly useful. Um, but I just, I, I really enjoy this. Um, it's a great app. It's very simple, um, but it's it's great fun. Very cool. Very cool. Um, uh, let's see. Let's have you do your next one, and then I think we'll move on to the next segment. And this next one is, I think, uh, a big one for anybody who uh, is in the professional uh, space, but also for folks outside of the professional space who just want to uh, have a really powerful um, video app. Yeah. So this app that I'm going to talk about now is Filmic Pro. And I should start with a disclaimer. I am aspirational when it comes to photos and videos. I do not know what I'm doing. I just like having a great app that can basically make, make things happen for me. And Filmic Pro is uh, $14.99. And basically the idea is much like Halid is like the camera app on steroids, Filmic Pro is the video camera on steroids where you have so many options when you open the settings. So you might have just seen as I'm talking, if you're watching the video version, there's a green bar across the bottom that's going up and down as I talk. Um, and it's showing you the peaks that I've hit. And it's also showing you when I'm being very quiet and things like that. And that is just one of the little features. So you can make sure that you, your, you, your audio is actually coming in. Um, you can you can change things like um, whether or not you should be using like if you've got a DJI Osmo, um, which I have and I've, I can't plug in unfortunately today because then I can't plug the uh, the phone into the the computer to share it. Um, then you can enable that. Um, there's also options to turn on and off the stabilization. So if you have found that you know something's not working, um, and uh, I found actually I was using this with a gyroscope um, the other day um, and. It, it was just doing something a little bit weird and I turned off stabilization because the gyroscope obviously was doing that stabilization for me and boom, it was done. Um, but you can create, um, sorry, cancel and uh, tap away. There we go. Um, so you can specify the, the resolution, which is something I really like. So sometimes you don't necessarily want a super high resolution. You're fine with standard um, definition or 720p. But you can do 1080p, um, you know, full HD, uh, full HD, 2K, 3K, and 4K. Um, and you can also change video. So cropping video is one of those things where if you do it after the fact, you, you're going to find like you're missing somebody's chin or the top of their head or something. Whereas if you if you do it <laughs> while you're filming, then you've got a much better chance of actually getting it right. So you can change your aspect ratio here as well. So it, it defaults to 16 by nine. You could do 17 by nine if you wanted, or three by two, one by one, that's a square. Um, and then it, it's got some other options as well. Um, and of course you can change the, uh, the quality that it saves at. I tend to leave this um, on just a 1080p HDMI because my TV is not that great. Um, and, uh, you know, at the end of the day, it's probably going to get watched on a small screen. So 4K isn't, maybe necessary, but at the same time, if you want 4K, you can do 4K. You can customize your frame rate. So if you want to capture 60 frames per second, um, then you can do that. Um, you can also specify which microphone to use. So the front microphone, 
on on your iPhone or the back microphone. Did you know that there's a back microphone? Yes, it's a uh, built in. Uh, I, I'm struggling to show this on screen, but it's <laughs> it's built in around by the camera. Um, so uh, it, there's also the options to use Bluetooth microphones, or you can use both the microphones built into your iPhone. Um, and if you've got a microphone plugged in, then of course it'll pick that up, and you can specify what what format it should save the audio source as, um, and so on. Of course, uh, on your device, you can specify whether or not things should save to the camera roll, whether or not you, it should be using a remote control. If you have a remote control, um, usually you get these with like selfie sticks and so on. Then you can tell it to use that. You can also force an orientation lock. So if you, you know, if you want to have portrait videos, you can do that. I'd recommend landscape videos if you can. Um, and um, there's also a sync option, um, which is very difficult to demo without connecting multiple devices. But essentially, you can have another application from Filmic, which is the remote application, and everything will sync up through that. Um, and basically, it means that you can have multiple iPhones or iPads or whatever devices you want, and you can record from all of them at the same time, and it syncs it up. It's like magic. Um, and there's also another app, which I'm just going to give a little shout out to because it's free. I have picked it before uh, here on iOS today, and that is Double Take by Filmic. If you want to film from both the selfie camera and the back camera at the same time, then that does it. And it's part of the Filmic you know, group suite of apps. Uh, so I would highly recommend that. Um, and Double Take is uh, listed here as well. Um, I had to reinstall it for today because it offloaded automatically because... There's been a pandemic, so I've not really been doing much. But if you you switch to that, then you're you're recording both your front and the back at the same time. So you can just see the, the dock of my Mac here um, and me. And you can, you know, move yourself around if you want to. Um, and uh, you can, you know, make things bigger. And it's got that histogram as well if you want. Um, and uh, you, you've got choices as to uh, which cameras you want to use. So you could use the telephoto lens as well as the wide lens at the same time or telephoto and ultra wide. Um, and then you just tap confirm and voila, that, that's all of them. Um, so uh, you, you have plenty of choices. And so Filmic uh, Pro itself is $14.99. So it's $15, which is, you know, if you want to take video and you found at any time that the stock camera app is perhaps a little bit limited or you just feel like you could do a better job with another app, then Filmic Pro is definitely the app for you. Um, I've got Filmic Pro, Filmic Remote, and Double Take, and they're they're great. It integrates with gimbals and things like that. So if you've got any of the DJI gimbals, um, they're they're very good. Um, it integrates with those. Integrates with some others as well. So I've got uh, I can't remember exactly which one I've got, but I found it in the apps the other day, and it was just working great. Um, and I I love that about this. Um, you know, it's got all of these options, and you can make some truly amazing things with this app. Of course, just like anything else, you can also make some rubbish, which I've definitely done. But at the end of the day, I am enjoying using Filmic Pro to make videos. Um, and uh, I think you would too. Excellent. Excellent. All righty. Um, up next, it's time for the news. That's right, folks. It's time for the news. Our first bit of news is a big bit of news. It is Apple's spring-loaded event, which will take place on April 20th. Um, I believe at 10 a.m., I think is the time. Uh, 10 a.m. Yeah, Pacific. 10 a.m. Pacific. And so you will be able to tune in uh, twit.tv slash live where uh, Leo Laporte and I will be covering that event live on at 10 a.m. Um, for folks who've not done that in the past, uh, we show the live stream and just add uh, commentary to it. So you will be able to see the whole event as um, Leo and I kind of provide context, share thoughts, etc. cetera. Um, so you'll be able to watch that there. But... Uh, in any case, 10 a.m. on April 20th, Apple will be announcing some new stuff. And uh, I'm curious, Rosemary, what you think. I've been asking this all week from on the different tech shows that I do. Um, and now I want to know what you think is going to be announced on April 20th. I think Apple is going to give me a free product from every single line in their product lineup. That's what's going to happen. Nice. Um, good I, good I, guess. No, I'm, I'm being incredibly optimistic here. Um, I, I suspect, um, considering, you know, we've had um, announcements of partnerships in the Find My Network 
over the last couple of weeks. Uh, um, those things are not coming out until June or July. Um, so you can sign up like to be on an early waiting list and then you get an email to say you can, you know, scramble by now. Uh, kind of like iPhone launch day only maybe not as cool. So I have a feeling we're going to see AirTags coming um, and maybe AirTags coming in May next month, maybe AirTags going on sale tomorrow. Uh, we do know that iOS 14.5 has been in beta forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. At least that's what it feels like to me. Um, I've got the developer beta. It feels like I'm installing updates uh, on a very all regular basis for yeah. the same the same beta. Um, and it feels like things don't really change all that much. Um, so I we're going to see that. And I think maybe we're going to see it with a new iPad. I would love to see, um, you know, if they, if they do bring us a new iPad, what are they going to do with it? Maybe, I mean, we're not going to see an M1 iPad Pro, right? But that would be pretty cool. I'd get one of those. Oh, hands down. If there was an M1 iPad Pro, uh, oh, yeah. you better believe your boy would have one of those. But yeah, I think oh, yeah, uh, definitely an iPad Pro. And just that that M1 part is. Eh. Yeah, well, I mean, let's see what happens, right? We've just got to be excited. I do hope that maybe this year, if they do an update to the iPad Air, that instead of doing the pastel colors they did last year, they go a bit darker. So we get like a nice dark foresty green or something. That would be nice. Okay. That, I, you, mm, I love forest green. <laughs> um, so that would be amazing. Uh, of course, well, I'm just looking you know. at the colors on that spring logo that they've got. Um, and right at the top on the leaf, of course, it's a leaf, so they had to go green. But that, that, that sort of sea foamy, turquoisey, foresty green at the top, um, you know, it, it depends on exactly which part of it you're like, yeah, it's a really nice green. I would love to see that on an iPad or maybe just, you know, iPad cases, magic keyboard in different colors. Yes. Um, we will see for sure what uh, Apple announces on uh, on the event day. And so I know um, many of us Apple nerds are looking forward to that. Um, but until then, we don't we don't know for sure, uh, especially with WWDC right around the corner. Um, there's plenty of time left to announce new stuff. Um, so we we shall see when that event comes. Um, moving on, Roku. Uh, who so so Roku recently released an update to its operating system that gave uh, Roku devices the Apple TV app. Um, it also offered uh, AirPlay two support and HomeKit support in some cases. My television, for example, it's a TCL Roku TV, uh, works with both AirPlay two and HomeKit. And so within the home app, I can um, turn on and off the television. I can change the volume. I can uh, change the input on the TV. Basically, everything that you could do uh, with an... Well, even, I think even more than you can do with an Apple TV because it is just the set-top box. And then it also, as I said, has AirPlay 2 support so you can beam content to it. So... Roku and Apple have been playing nice in that space for a while, and now they've got a new remote out that has an Apple TV Plus button on it. Um, so you may be familiar, anybody who's had a Roku TV, sometimes Roku will include, and some of the remotes do too, include buttons for uh, different services. And it can be kind of dangerous to do that because sometimes services go away. Um, there was a time where a Hulu button might not have been uh, advisable, but uh, we're past that time now. And so, you know, the Hulu button is there, but now there's an Apple TV Plus button. You tap that and it launches the Apple TV app uh, where you can see the content that's there. And then, Rosemary, they also have a Find My Remote feature. What's that all about? Yeah. So anybody who's ever lost their remote control, uh, put your hand up. Yes, that, that includes me. I've lost all of my remote controls at the same time. I was moving. Um, it, it's never a good idea to move house. Um, but the, the problem <laughs> with remote controls is, you know, they, they slide off things. And the Apple TV remote is famous for this because the front is glass and the back is a nice slippery metal. The entire thing is very slim. And the place where it normally ends up living is inside your couch cushions, uh, just because it's going to slide down there somehow. Don't ask me how nothing else of mine ever goes down there. Like no popcorn, nothing. But the Apple TV remote seems to just have this magnetic attraction um, to that. Um, and so if you if you lose your Roku remote, then you can use the Find My to find the remote. Um, I'm, I've, I, I read through this and I wasn't 100% sure 
how um, how it works um, because there's a little chime. So there's got to be a teeny tiny speaker in there somehow. I don't know how loud that's going to be. Um, uh, so you might have to, uh, you know, get everybody to be really quiet. Um, but the good news is, is you can also uh, use Hey Roku uh, to uh, adjust the volume and control playback. So you can, you know, pause what's on your screen um, and uh, then, you know, um, ask it to find your remote again. And uh, then hopefully you'll hear it. Um, so uh, yeah, that's great. I'm I'm looking forward to that. I do feel that more items that are potentially easily misplaced slash carried off by by small people or animals uh, should contain tracking devices automatically. Um, and uh, I know of enough people who whose toddlers have you know stolen the Apple TV remote and then they never find it again. Um, that I feel like this is, is a worthy update to any remote control. Agreed. Uh, a thousand percent agreed. I want it for the Apple TV Siri remote as well. Yeah. Um, Mac Rumors has uh, a piece talking about Van Moof, um, where Van Moof and uh, so let me kind of back up a little bit. Apple recently announced, uh, we talked about it last week, it's Find My Network accessory program where uh, different third parties would be able to take advantage of Apple's Find My Network. And one of those products was Van Moof, which makes electric bikes. Um, that actually involved quite a process. Uh, Mac Rumors writes that Van Moof and Apple spent nine months working to integrate e-bikes into Apple's Find My ecosystem. Because it turns out there's a lot involved in that, yeah? Yeah, yeah, there is. Um, so um, apparently this this started out with um, uh, Apple, you know, announced, you know, th- its plans. And that was WWDC last year. And one of the engineers from Van Move posted a message on in the developer forum and said, you know, basically, this is super interesting. And Apple was looking for partners. And so Van Move maybe got lucky, maybe, maybe, um, you know, Apple were scouting for them specifically already. Um, and they, they got to work with them. And so there've been prototype bikes, which have been sent for evaluation and things like this. So Apple's taking, um, a lot more int- interest in this than they take in things like lightning cables. Um, because, I mean, not just anybody can make a lightning cable. Actually, anybody could make a lightning cable, but there's a certification process involved uh, from Apple to make sure that it meets Apple's standards. So the really cheap ones that you can buy for a dollar or two, they're probably not certified. Um, But the the nicer ones like Anchor, Belkin, um, 12 South, um, anything, any companies that make, you know, good devices, the ones that charge more basically, um, have these nice cables, which are certified by Apple. Um, and it seems like, you know, this is that times a thousand with that entire setup. Um, but it does say that uh, Van Moof didn't feel like it was ever too much pressure from Apple. So that's that's great. Um, and I love the fact that this is purely a software feature. Um, they haven't had to change any of the hardware on their bike. Um, and that's that's pretty cool that they they already had the stuff in there. Um, and uh, it does say it's the approximate location of the bike, of course, um, you know, that that, you know, varies uh, depending on, you know, devices and GPS signal and things like that. I know um, in the Netherlands, uh, a lot of my friends there would just park bike outside. I'm guessing something nicer like a Van Moof bike, they'll probably park in their, in their basement um, or <laughs> yeah. uh, downstairs storage cupboard if they have one. Um, though, of course, some people do just keep them in the living room because they're using them every day and that's the most convenient for them. Um, but, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's really interesting, uh, to find out a little bit more behind this. Uh, I tried to read the article in Dutch. I do speak German, but, uh, my, my Dutch is absolutely terrible. So, uh, I I ended up putting it through Google translate to get a little bit more information. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's very, very interesting to, uh, hear all about that and a, a rare look behind the scenes of, uh, how Apple works with these people. Um, speaking of Van Moof, uh, we actually had our own Aunt Pruitt who did a review of the Van Moof S3 on hands-on tech. Um, so he was able to check out the Van Moof um, electric bike and uh, did a review of it. And of course, he is an incredible videographer and photographer. Um, so you can check out his review to uh, to get a better look at that and and all of its beauty, all of its buttery goodness uh, that his uh, videography provides. Um, so yeah, you can learn more about that. He calls it the Tesla of e-bikes from Van Moof. Um, last but not least, 
I saw this fly by, Rosemary. Um, Australia, Apple Maps, was having a bit of an issue due to some data brokerage. Tell me more about this. Yeah. So essentially, Apple doesn't just know automatically where everything in the world is. They import data. And in different countries, they import data from different sources. Um, and uh, precisely which source belongs to which country and how they do that, of course, you know, I, I don't know all details. But it seems that what happened in Australia is there is a register of businesses and it's got the name of the owner and it's got the owner's address as well as the, the title of the business. And uh, it seems like somebody swapped a column somewhere. So if you imagine this as a giant like numbers document or for those of you familiar with databases, it seems that they imported residential or like address of registration as the business address. Um, and um, that's a little bit tricky um, because it means that people have been getting wrong directions to places. Um, and more importantly, uh, that people have been turning up in at their, you know, the 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 owner's house instead of the restaurant that they were supposed to go to. Um, and uh, Russell Ivanovich, who I've met before, um, was uh, saying that uh, he's his suburb has got like 30 restaurants in people's houses. But of course, I don't think he's going around to any of them for dinner. Um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he could try. Um, but uh, ap apparently people have been struggling with this. They've been reporting things. But of course, if you don't know where you're going and you just type the name of the restaurant into Apple Maps um, and you know... Yeah, it's about 45 minutes away and Apple gives you a drive that seems like 45 minutes. If you end up in the wrong place, then that's no good. But it's not just restaurants, hospitals, pharmacies, oh, and yikes. more stuff has, uh, you know, been uh, been affected. Um, and um, they, so it seems like um, it's causing some scam calls. Um, and uh, I think uh, somebody has said that it, it, they think they got it from the Australian Business Network records. I think it's, I think ABN stands for Australian Business Network. Um, but uh, I, I believe Apple uh, are, are working on that pretty quickly uh, because that's a whole lot of data that's wrong. Um, but uh, yeah, hopefully it'll be fixed soon. Apparently uh, dangerous, uh, as, as you pointed out, some dangerous things involved in that that uh, data being incorrect uh, since it goes past just being restaurants yeah. and things like that. Um, all right. Yeah. I think I that I feel means... like this is a good time to remind people. Oh, no, go ahead. I was going to say, go I feel ahead. like this is a good time to remind people that you should save your uh, save your local hospital's address um, and your, your local uh, emergency services uh, address, like for, for minor injuries and stuff like that in your phone, um, just because that way you've always got it there. And if you ever need it, then, you know, you're not Googling for things at the last minute. It's always worth having that. Um, and then if you ever have an appointment, it's easy to just type in the name of it and voila, off you go. There you go. Um, all right. Up next, it's Shortcuts Corner. Shortcuts Corner. It's time for Shortcuts Corner. Bottom. Uh, Rosemary Orchard, tell us what comes first in Shortcuts Corner. Well, uh, the first thing is that people send us things, which we love. And we've had some things come in on Twitter. We've had some things come in by email and they're all greatly appreciated. Um, and uh, so the first question that we have today is from Harry. And Harry says, I love the show and the new shortcut segment. Well, thank you, Harry. Uh, I, I'm glad you do. Uh, Harry continues. I have a question about motion sensors. I have Hue lights and a Hue motion sensor. I've tried to use the Hue app and shortcuts, but the lights don't work like I would like. The light comes on when someone enters the hallway, but it goes off too soon. Um, uh, so if the light goes off while we are in front of the sensor getting on jackets or shoes. Any help would be greatly appreciated. Well, you came to the right place, Harry, because while this isn't technically a shortcuts question, you could maybe solve it with shortcuts, uh, but you can solve it directly in the Home app. Now, the first thing uh, I would like to do is explain about motion sensors a little bit. So I have my Philips Hue motion sensor from my office right here. Um, and essentially, if I wave my hand in front of it, then it detects that as motion. But then for the next minute or so, it's not really going to look for things. It's just going to go, okay, that's cool. Because otherwise it's using loads of battery. And these things, you know, they're not very big. They've got quite a small battery inside them. Um, you can unscrew it and replace the battery, by the way. Uh, so if your, your motion sensor stops working, then do that. The second thing I would like to say is you've tried both the Hue app and the Shortcuts app. I would highly recommend you go into the Hue app, you remove whatever you did there. You go into the Shortcuts app and you remove whatever you did there. 
because the last thing that you want to do is uh, have multiple things uh, going on and off at the same time and messing with stuff. This is what happens with Ghostbusters. Don't cross the streams. Try not to use multiple different automations at the same time uh, because that's when weird stuff starts happening and you start emailing us and going, my lights are coming off and then they're going on again and it, what's going on? And I had that myself. I set up a, a system in my hallway using a camera as a motion sensor to turn on the light. Don't do that, people. The reason why, the light turning off or turning on may, is detected as motion on the camera. That's why you don't do that. Um, as I learned at three o'clock in the morning when my lights wouldn't stop turning on enough. So I fixed that and I can fix Harry's problem as well. So I'm just going to show my iPhone here on the screen. And this is my hallway. Um, so I've got some, some scenes with some weird names. I was experimenting with things. I've got a heater and I've got an overhead light. Um, and in here, we can see I've got a whole bunch of sensors. Um, but I've got this one here, which is when motion is detected in the hallway, and in this case, it's between 6 p.m. and uh, 11, uh, 6 a.m. and 11 p.m. Turn on the hallway overhead to 70%. Before anybody tells me about waiting for, uh, about saving energy, my hallway has no windows. It's entirely dependent on the overhead light and lights coming in from other rooms. So I'm going to cancel this and I am going to add an automation for this light. Um, so I'll go through and show you exactly how this works. So to start with, you create an automation. And you say when an, ex oh, uh, sorry. Um, you say a sensor detects something. That's uh, what we're doing here. So here in my hallway, we've got a couple of different sensors. We can check whether or not my dehumidifier is leaking, whether or not the air is open, my front door is open, and I have a motion sensor. Uh, I've got two, but that's beside the point. So when my hallway motion sensor detects motion, and this is what you want, you want to turn on the overhead light. And this light was already selected because I started creating the automation from the light. So that's a bonus tip. And then turn off you can go through and you can change that to anything you like. So you could do 15 minutes. Um, you can go all the way down to one minute. I would suggest don't do that um, because that's what's causing your problem. And you can go all the way up to four hours. So uh, that's probably a little bit long, but I would suggest sort of 10, 15 minutes is probably going to be about your sweet spot there. Um, and then you just do that and done. And that's it. That's all you do. You don't need to do anything in shortcuts or anything. Um, you, you just need to create an automation in the home app. You could go through shortcuts to create this, um, but there, there's no reason to. It's easier to create this in the home app with the light or lights that you want to control. Uh, so I would recommend doing that. Nice. Very nice. Um, this next one comes from Antonio, uh, who says, I just wanted to thank you both for restarting my interest in creating shortcuts for my agency and my personal use. Are there any resources you could point me out to keep learning besides modifying code from others? Best regards, Antonio. And Antonio has a good point here. Um, the best way to start is by taking shortcuts that already exist and kind of seeing how they're built and then pulling apart and picking them and figuring out what works for you. Uh, but then after that, you kind of want to take off. And uh, Antonio is wondering about some, some resources. And I believe, uh, Rosemary, you've got uh, quite a few suggestions here. Yeah, so I have several suggestions. Um, and the, the first one is Apple has a documentation website. Um, and so I would recommend you check out the Shortcuts User Guide. Um, and the Shortcuts User Guide is great for a variety of things. First of all, it goes through what's a shortcut um, and how shortcuts work, and what is an individual action inside of a shortcut, um, and what's an automation, creating personal automations, finding shortcuts, and exploring the gallery. And speaking of exploring the gallery, um, I would uh, like to show you this, but my iPhone has disappeared. So I'm just going to fix that. Oops. There we go. Um, so inside of the shortcuts application, you've got my shortcuts, you've got automation, and then you've got the gallery. Um, and if, you, if you're on an iPad, this will be over on the left side in the sidebar. Um, and inside of shortcuts, first of all, I want to talk about this in the gallery. There's starter shortcuts at the top. Some of these come pre-installed um, in the Shortcuts app, so people should have a look at those. There's a folder uh, under My Shortcuts. Um, if I just go back, there's a folder um, called Starter Shortcuts. Mine is empty. I removed those shortcuts because I have too many shortcuts. Uh, but there's things like taking a break, so it will set a new alarm and turns on Do Not Disturb until that alarm goes off. Um, there's creating a new note with today's date, texting your last image, shazamming some music, making a QR code, things like that. Underneath this, 
automation suggestions. Automation suggestions is one of my favorite things ever. So for example, going home, automate the things that you usually do when you're going home. At 10 o'clock in the morning, open Safari. Uh, At one o'clock on weekdays, run this automation, um, which is my clock out automation. Uh, Eight o'clock in the morning, check my deliveries. Uh, Eight o'clock in the morning, check in. Can anybody guess my regular working hours? Um, And there's also some shortcuts from my apps, like creating a new event in Fantastical, uh, seeing my today articles in Net Newswire, um, typing to Card Hop, uh, checking my time asleep in um, in uh, the uh, Auto Sleep app, viewing my recent album, things like that, calling my mom, um, checking the XKCD for the day, and things like that. So these are a great way for everybody to get started. These require zero effort on your part, um, and then you know there's there's other shortcuts as well. So there's quick shortcuts. Apple Music related shortcuts, health related shortcuts, only focus related shortcuts. That's my my t- task manager of choice. Um, there's all sorts of things here. Uh, so I would highly recommend uh, if you're looking for more things to take apart and you you just want to start with something, then this is a great place to go. Um, and of course, at the top of the gallery, there's a search as well. So you can do that. Um, the other things that I would like to mention, Micah, uh, so Micah has a podcast here on the Twit Network with a lovely person called Matthew Castanelli. They podcast every week about smart tech today and talk about, you know, smart tech in the modern world. Matthew Castanelli is a shortcuts genius. So you should check out his website and his newsletter where he has loads of things uh, set up. He does a weekly newsletter that, or, you know, almost weekly, um, which is uh, what's new in shortcuts um, and uh you know, tells you, you know, some of the things that you're, you're going to get in the next version of shortcuts and so on. Um, and uh, it gives you examples. Um, and uh, he's great. He's got a little gallery of shortcuts there as well. Uh, David Sparks, who I host another podcast with called Automators, which might be worth your checking out if you're uh, interested in automation. Uh, we talk about shortcuts a lot. David Sparks has a uh, Siri shortcuts course, which is all about uh, creating shortcuts and so on. Um, and, uh, that's a video based guide, uh, which is uh, $29 to enroll in. Um, if you, if you wanted to, to pay something for that. And also, uh, I cre- I wrote a book on shortcuts called take control of shortcuts, uh, Heck which yeah. is another option. If the, if the other options don't suffice, then of course for, for $12, um, then you can, you can buy uh, my book. Um, but make sure you check out all of the other options first, because you can learn so much for free. Um, and, uh, of course, you know, there's also subreddits on Reddit, uh, shortcuts, um, and things like that, where you can ask people and, you know, Slack user groups and so on. But, uh, definitely asking, um, us was a great way to get started. Beautiful. Thank you, um, Antonio, for writing in. And uh, I hope that uh, you continue your shortcuts journey. Alrighty, folks, we are near the end of the show, which means it's time for App Caps. We both got the black memo. Yep. We're very in sync. We are. Um, folks, this is the app cap segment, the part of the show where we wear silly caps to honor our app caps, the app pick of the week, either an app we have uh, been using for a while that we want to share with you or a new one we've come across that we're excited about. Um, I am wearing a a pretty spooky hat, uh, normally reserved for Halloween, but, um, it just felt appropriate today, and now I know why. Because Rosemary, you are also wearing a black hat of sorts. Do you want to tell us about your hat and tell us uh, about well, your pick of the week? Well, my hat is a black baseball cap, and I'm just going to take it off and show people the back. It's uh, Max Doc 2019. Max Doc is a conference that usually happens on a yearly basis where people meet up and talk about Max and iOS devices. And on the front, it's got embroidered "Peace, Love, and Max," and that's what, <laughs> that's what the original Max right there. Um, because you know why not? And it's icons. Um, and my app cap this week is not an app, Micah. I didn't get that memo. Darn it! But I continued the black theme. <laughs> um, so I'm going a little off book this week. And my app cap is not an app. My app cap is a piece of hardware. And it's this, it is the Anchor PowerCore Magnetic 5K Wireless Power Bank. Um, And this is, uh, for people who aren't watching the video stream, a fairly small uh, power bank. It fits in, it fits in my hand, it's nice and slim. um, And it's magnetic. So what happens is you can connect it to your iPhone. uh, And you do that by just putting it on the back and joink, it connects to the MagSafe 
and my iPhone is charging. Um, and I love this power bank. It, it's small. Um, when I am trying to type on my iPhone, uh, it kind of works as a pop socket so I can rest my phone on my fingers because the magnet is strong enough to do that. Yes, really. Um, and the other thing about this is it's USB-C. Um, I am fed up with things shipping with uh, micro or mini USB adapters. I plug them in upside down every single time. It drives me nuts. Uh, but this, it's small. It does charge your phone quite slowly. Uh, it's only outputting five watts, but it's also only a 5K power bank. Um, so it, it's not, you know, going to last forever, but it magnetizes on there really well. You know, I just put it on. There's a slightly satisfying clunk. My phone vibrates and that's it. Now, the first time that I put this on here, it did not do that. And that's because on the bottom, there's a little button. Um, and that button is to uh, check the battery level, uh, but it also turns on the battery pack. So if it's not been used in a while, for example, uh, then it will just turn off. And then if it just magnetizes to your phone by accident or something, it's not going to start charging it. But when it is working, there's a little blue light that shines up. Um, or lights up and uh, that lets you know it's charging. And you know what? I'm pretty happy with this. Uh, it's about $40 on Amazon when they're available. These are not um, yet widely available for everybody, at least in the US. In the UK, they are available on Amazon right now um, as we record this show um, and yesterday when I ordered mine. Um, but uh, they're also going to be doing a 10K one. The 10K one that's available right now is not magnetic. It's just Qi charging. Um, so I uh, watch out for that. But these ones are actually magnetic. And uh, that means that, you know, if you, you tip it off and it doesn't, you know, it's not going to charge, but then you just pop it back on and it just junk, aligns into place and that's going nowhere fast. So uh, <laughs> 10 out of 10, again, from Anchor. Affordable. I'm looking forward to seeing what Apple does, whether or not they're going to get faster charging into this. But at the same time, like I don't need to mess with cables or anything. I can just have this in my bag. Um, and because it's USB-C, it ships with a USB-C to USB-C cable. So you can, you know, use a nice uh, USB-C power bank, like, uh, sorry, uh, Walwart, like the uh, 20 watt one that Apple sells. That is awesome. Um the one that, the, so my app cap this week is actually one that we uh, had talked about before, um, but it is uh, one that I've been playing kind of, <laughs> I, I hate to say nonstop since um, since it was first kind of announced um, last, uh, whenever the Apple Arcade update came in. I'm just trying to make things look a little bit easier for you to see here. There we go. This is... Um, Star Trek Legends available on Apple Arcade. And it is a um, turn-based strategy game uh, where you play as different characters from the Star Trek universe. Um, there are shuttle um, missions that you can go on to collect supplies. Uh, there are actual missions here. Um, I do need to mention that this uh, th there are still some bugs that these folks need to iron out. Um, I have had some issues uh, with it, and I will choose to keep the local version. Um, and so sometimes I've had to restart, but they are issuing updates pretty regularly to try and fix those bugs. Um, but you can kind of choose the characters that you want to play and then um, kind of build them up over time. So I've got my crew here. Uh, Captain Janeway is is the person that I've worked the the most on. Um, and so she kind of leads the charge in every battle. Uh, Leonard McCoy was one of the first characters that you get. And so I just stuck with Leonard McCoy. Um, not a big original series fan, but uh, Dr. Leonard McCoy does a great job uh, of healing my party. Worf, who is an excellent combatant. And then originally Michael Burnham, who's also one of the first characters you get, was my um, fourth person. But when Seven of Nine came around... I had to move seven of nine up as quickly as I could. So seven of nine, uh, I kind of upgraded her as quick as I possibly could to get her into my top crew and her and Michael Burnham switch on and off, depending on if I need an engineer or a scientist with me, uh, for battles. You can also battle against other players online, uh, with the PVP stuff. Um, you can join an alliance. So it's like a group where you and your other friends kind of, or crew battle against other people. Um, over time, you can summon more characters. You have to gain uh, little bits and bops for that. Um, and then uh, you can also get ongoing combat 
uh, perks by assigning different members to your crew so that the away team will get, uh, right now, because of, of the team that I have set up, um, you get 3% plus health, 3% plus health, uh, 3% to attack, all these different things because of the members that I've assigned to the crew here on the ship. Um, there are different events that you can do that also let you collect uh, stuff. So I have, uh, you know, done this, the Odo event. And at the end you get Odo. Um, if you don't already have him, I actually already have Odo. And, uh, he, if I would have gotten him a little bit earlier, he would have been in my top four because Odo is one of my favorites. Um, absolutely. But, um, it is actually quite a bit of fun. And once again, I found another game that I'm playing for more than a day, which, uh, who knew that 2021 was going to be the year of me being interested in gaming of any kind? Um, between this and Homescapes, uh, I've been having quite a bit of fun playing little games on my phone. And uh, I, I've shocked myself with that. Um, it's an Apple Arcade game, so you will need to have an Apple Arcade subscription to uh, use it. But if you haven't started your Apple Arcade subscription, you can get a free trial of it and get to check it out there. Uh, it is a lot of fun if you like turn-based strategy games, a little bit RPG, a little bit, you know, uh, resource collection and all of that comes together. And because it's an Apple Arcade game, there's no pay to play nonsense. There are no ads. Um, and so you can, you just literally keep playing to collect stuff. And then um, you can use those resources to uh, build out your team and make them stronger and complete the main missions. And then over time, they're adding more missions as you go. So yeah, it's a lot of fun. And especially as you start to unlock skills and things like that, uh, as your people get more powerful. Um, my Janeway has an incredible strength uh, and just really just brings things to a close very quickly. Uh, but folks, that brings us to the end of this episode of iOS Today. I want to thank so much of you. Thanks so much to those of you who chose to write in with your uh, questions. You can send your questions to iOS Today at twit.tv. Um, and thanks to those of you who tuned in live by going to twit.tv slash live and chatted with us by going to irc.twit.tv. If you want to be part of that group, you just uh, go to twit.tv slash live every Friday at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific, whenever we record the show. We were early this week. Uh, we updated the calendar when that happened, but normally 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. Rosemary Orchard, if folks want to follow you online and check out your great work, where do they go to do that? Well, the best place to go is rosemaryorchard.com, which has links to all of the things that I do, including this lovely show. Um, and of course, you can also find me on micro.blog and Twitter at Rosemary Orchard. Micah, where can people find you? You can find me online on all the social media networks that I can uh, come across at Micah Sargent or head to chihuahua.coffee, C-H-I-H-U-A-H-U-A.coffee, where I've got links to the places I'm most active. Um, of course, you should not forget to subscribe to the show by going to twit.tv slash iOS, where you can subscribe in audio and video formats across Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, all the places we try to be there. So if you're not subscribed, click that subscribe button. And we thank you once more for joining us for this week's episode of iOS Today. Until next week, I've been Micah Sargent, and you've been Rosemary Orchard, and this has been iOS Today. Goodbye. Sometimes the news of the week is best told by the people making and breaking it, and that is the essence of Tech News Weekly. Join me, Jason Howell, along with my co-host, Micah Sargent, as we interview the people who are breaking the news that you're probably already talking about. Plus, sometimes we actually get the people who are making the news, the people behind the story. That's Tech News Weekly on twit.tv. Twit.tv.